Welcome to Inventing Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Brittany Zimmerman, my co-host, Richard Hopp. Joining us today is our guest, Dr. Chris Codswell. Today, we're going to talk about inventions starting with the letter A. We'll be back in just a moment. Hello, Richard. Aloha, everybody. Aloha, Brittany. Hey, and um, today we have a distinguished guest, Dr. Chris Cogswell, joining us again. And we are going to be talking about an invention starting with the letter A. So I don't know if we can do our own little drum roll here, but we're excited because today we are going to be talking about air revitalization. So first, Richard, what do you think of when you hear air revitalization? You know what that means? Yeah, uh, I, it, it, it means revitalization of air. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to find out a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. That is exactly what it is. And so what we're going to walk through today um, is some different methodologies, uh, techniques, and technologies on how to take air and make sure that it's clean uh, and very breathable, right? Healthy for us. Um, this is something we do a lot of in space, as you can imagine, right? If you're in a space suit, or you're in a spacecraft, or you're in a habitat, um, all of your air has to be recirculated, right? Revitalized, reutilized. And so it's something we utilize uh, a lot in space travel. But it is not only for space anymore. This is something we utilize, of course, here on our beautiful planet Earth also. And we have Dr. Chris Cogswell with us. And uh, he might know a thing or two about this topic. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Richard, uh, for having me again. Very excited to be your second. I was your first and second guest. So very excited. <laughs> very, very glad to be here. Um, yeah, air, re air revitalization is quite an interesting topic. Like you said, Brittany, something that, you know, you're forced to do in space, right? You're forced to do in confined environments. On Earth, we sort of, I guess, thought we wouldn't have to worry about that. Too much. We figured, you know, well, the Earth is great at revitalizing the air on its own. And it turns out we're really good at making the air not great. So we do need to <laughs> think about revitalizing it a little bit. And so that's what we'll talk be talking about here today. Yes. Thank you so much, Chris. We're really excited about that. So um, when we look at, you know, why do we need to revitalize air? I think that's what Chris started touching on, right? It's, you know, as we're burning fossil fuels, as we're releasing different pollutants um, out into the atmosphere, we get contaminants. And so as those contaminant levels build up, it's our responsibility to make sure that we are being responsible, right? Um, as individuals, you know, certainly within industry, um, but I think also as the citizens who know how to deal with these sort of things uh, to make sure that we're helping with the issues that are at hand, right? And how do we take those greenhouse gas levels down? How do we pull out those contaminants, you know? Um, and maybe we can start looking at that. Maybe Chris, the first thing you wanna talk through and maybe you can educate us on is what are some of those contaminants, right? We hear terms like NOx and VOG and CO2 and methane and all of these things. Um, what, can, can you enlighten us? Yeah, absolutely. So, in general, when we're talking about air pollution, so the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere is composed of gases, and the two most prominent of those are nitrogen and oxygen. Oxygen that we breathe, nitrogen that we don't, but doesn't hurt us, right? Nitrogen is very inert, so not too bad of a chemical, makes up about 70% of our, of our atmosphere. What is sort of un... I guess, so... The thing with a chemical or the thing with a chemical system is that they're always in what's called equilibrium with each other. So if you think about, imagine that you have a cup of Kool-Aid mm. and you have a big gallon of water, clean water. If you dunk the thing of Kool-Aid into the gallon of water, what's going to happen? It's going to mix. It's going to mix, right? <laughs> The Kool-Aid, if you pour the Kool-Aid in, it's not going to stay in one little spot, right? It's going to spread out naturally and mix. 
Mm-hmm. And so that's what happens with any sort of pollutant that we release, anything we release into the environment is it will disperse and it will spread. And so anything that we release as humans ends up in the atmosphere if it's a gaseous kind of release, right? So things like um, nitrous oxides, that's what you said, NOx, N-O-X, right? These are nitrogen oxygen compounds. We have sulfur oxygen compounds. These are called SOX. SOX is responsible for acid rain because what happens is the sulfur in the SOX gets mixed with water and becomes sulfuric acid. We have CO2 and other greenhouse gases, things like methane. Um, There are also other things, too. There's uh, what are called CFCs. If you remember from like the 90s, we were really worried about releasing CFCs in the environment, into the atmosphere, because it could cause a hole in the ozone layer. Um, Basically, if you burn something, if you leave something out for too long, you know, out in the sun or whatever, uh, anything that evaporates away is going into the atmosphere. Now, obviously, the thing that we're the most concerned about today in terms of kind of industry is the collection of greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane and these other sorts of compounds. And again, those are just gas molecules that are in the atmosphere. But the Mm -hmm. reason they're so problematic is that these compounds, basically, they take in heat energy. They take in light energy and store that energy as heat. And so that's what causes the greenhouse effect. So, you know, if you look at, say, carbon dioxide, what happens with the greenhouse effect is you have some amount of the atmosphere of the Earth is around the the planet, of course, and sun rays come through the atmosphere and hit the Earth, and then they have to bounce back, right? They, they, they kind of bounce back off of the atmosphere or through the atmosphere, But certain chemicals stop that energy from leaving. And those are greenhouse gases like methane, like CO2. Mm -hmm. And so really what you're doing is you're making it harder for heat energy to dissipate out of the atmosphere back into, you know, the upper atmosphere space, Mm -hmm. things like that. Gotcha. Okay, very cool. And so one of the things I think is important in this realm, too, is when you're talking about equilibrium, right, when we're seeing these greenhouse gases, I think that there is a misconception also uh, that exists that, you know, oh, well, there's a lot of coal being burned in China. So they have, you know, the dirtiest airs and, and, and India. Well, they definitely have high particulates in the air. But with some of the greenhouse gases, we actually see equilibrium that's hit around the entire planet very quickly, right? And I think that's less known that, you know, if you're emitting carbon dioxide in uh, China or in India from from coal facilities, or maybe you're doing that here, right? Where we burn bunker oil in Hawaii, or maybe in New Hampshire, uh, you're driving your vehicle. Regardless of where that's coming out, in approximately a month, we actually see a steady state that's hit, right? That equilibrium has hit across the entire globe. So you'll see that CO2, you know, reach equilibrium in terms of, you know, the layers uh, in the atmosphere. And then you'll see it kind of follow its latitude around the globe. And then you'll see it expand there longitudinally, right? And then it'll hit equilibrium between its oceans uh, and the sediment. So within a month, we're actually breathing you know, carbon dioxide, perhaps, you know, in my breath here in Hawaii that you've released in New Hampshire, right? And so it really is a global issue that we're facing, um, the rejection of heat and the inhalation um, of a lot of these contaminants are directly affecting us um, here in Hawaii uh, and everywhere on the planet. So this is uh, a pretty interesting thing. So, all right, Richard. You have any questions for Chris right out of the gates about uh, some of the, I don't know, greenhouse gases or particulates or any questions about what the problem is before maybe we jump into what some of the solutions are? Just an observation, you know, that uh, in in a month's time, it goes all the way around and dissipates and it's everywhere. Holy smokes. That's an interesting thing. Yeah. 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 You know, it's, it's funny. The, one of the historical, one of the cases we really look out for that actually is things like when Chernobyl 
um, when that disaster occurred, or even say with like Fukushima, right? How quickly did it take radiation, radioactive particles that were in the air to actually travel, right? To hit the rest of the mainland, or even say with the um, the train derailment in Ohio that happened recently, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, again, that 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 source of chemicals, right? Whatever that release happened, it doesn't stay in the one spot. It mixes with the whole atmosphere. Mm-hmm. We think the move, the wind is constantly blowing, right? So it's constantly moving those things around and mixing them. So, you know, what, what maybe for the first week or so is a local problem very quickly becomes a global problem. You know, um, there was a saying back in the kind of early days of, um, in the early days of environmental science, right? Dilution is the solution to pollution. (laughs) <laughs> right? It's not. Dilution is not the solution, right? Um, all you're sort of doing is um, you're just kind of kicking the can down the road. But eventually, you know, those chemicals, they don't, a lot of these chemicals don't dissipate. They don't go away naturally in the environment. It's not like, you know, um, like CO2 is a good example of this. We know that, for example, plants, um, plants take in CO2 and then release oxygen, right? So, mm-hmm. Before humans, or I guess not really before humans, but say before the Industrial Revolution, the rate that we released CO2 wasn't enough where plants couldn't keep up, right? So the system was in equilibrium. Mm -hmm. But we now release so much CO2 into the atmosphere, so many greenhouse gases, that the natural systems that normally would handle this can't keep up. You know, it's, again, it's, It's like a, you know, it's like a body, right? Um, You know, if you're exercising every day, yeah, you can get rid of all of the calories and fat and whatever. But if you eat, you know, 50 cheeseburgers a meal, it's going to catch up to you, right? (laughs) You've kind of been shoving cheeseburgers into the earth's mouth for, you know, 70 to 200 years. Yeah. 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 And so... I think maybe then this is a good transition point, Chris. Um, I know that your PhD and your specialty really focused on some of this. So can you walk us through what some of the -the state-of-the-art technologies are um, for how, what do we do, right? I mean, what kinds of solutions exist that um, that may be applicable to uh, us here in Hawaii or, you know, people around the globe uh, that may be of interest to us? And can yeah, you whiteboard for us? I will whiteboard. That's what I'm going to go do. So here, <laughs> I'll share my whiteboard. So everyone should be able to see this now, hopefully. <laughs> Part of the challenge. So first off, if we're talking about greenhouse gases or pollutants, we're talking about molecules, right? And so these materials are very, very small, right? And so you can think that, for example, CO2 what CO2 actually looks like if we were to say to draw it as a as a dot structure, a Lewis dot structure, is it's a central carbon with two oxygen molecules off the sides. And now this um this is quite small, right? CO2 is quite a small thing. And in the atmosphere, the amount of CO2 that we're dealing with is actually it's it's high for what it should be right for what equilibrium requires, but it's still pretty, um, it's pretty dilute still, right? We're not talking like a 10% CO2 composition in the atmosphere or something. We're talking less than a percent of a percent. So it's small, but it's enough to cause a really, you know, large change in the, um, in the temperature. So the way that we actually have to remove CO2, basically, if you're trying to capture something that's the size of a molecule, you have to use a another sort of chemical system or something small enough to take that in. So we actually have two different ways of doing this. So the ways that we capture things, we have two types. We have adsorption. So that's ADS, adsorption. And we have absorption, ABS. Now, adsorption, or let's start with absorption. This is the one that you're the most probably comfortable with um, in your day-to-day life. Absorption is, for example, what a sponge does to water. Um, so it 
or no, actually, no, it's not. Never mind. I got my things mixed up. Absorption is like what a sponge does to water. Mm-hmm. I got my ads and my abs mixed up. <laughs> right. So um, what adsorption does is this is a solid material. Um, taking in a liquid, so a fluid, what we call a fluid. And a fluid is a gas or a liquid. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Absorption is a fluid capturing another fluid. All right. So carbon dioxide getting into the ocean, that's absorption. But water getting stuck onto a sponge, that's adsorption. Okay. Now, there's two different kind of -of state-of-the-art methods for capturing CO2 from the air. The first thing is, since you have a really dilute CO2 stream coming in, right, so it's dilute CO2, the first thing you basically usually do is this is just in the air, right? So this is in an air system. And so what you do is you have this go through essentially like a big fan, Right, some kind of pump or something. Right? Mm-hmm. That then flows into what's called a scrubber system. And there's a couple of different types of scrubbers. And what that scrubber system essentially does is it pulls out the CO2 and gets it stuck in here in the scrubber itself and releases clean air. But Just like a sponge, if a sponge takes up a lot of water, eventually it can't take up any more water, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you do to the sponge? You have to wring it out, right? You wring it out, and then you can capture more water. Eventually, the CO2 that gets stuck in the scrubber has to be released back. Now, it doesn't get released in the atmosphere. We can turn it into something like, say, you know, food-grade CO2 or whatever, But this is why people talk about things like carbon capture and storage. So carbon CO2 storage. Mm -hmm. What they're talking about is once you capture the CO2, well, what do you do with it? Does Mm -hmm. that make sense to everybody? Yep. All right. There are two really common ways of capturing CO2 from the air. The first one is what's called a liquid amine scrubber. And so just liquid amines. And the other one is what's called a solid adsorbent. Now, liquid amines, what these do, essentially you have a molecule that has an NH2 and NH3 ending on it. This nitrogen group is actually really good at capturing CO2. It really likes taking in CO2. And so it actually has a chemical reaction that occurs, and that's what allows it to capture CO2. Now, there are some problems with this sort of method, though, right? Amines are very corrosive. Amines are actually really bad for the environment on their own. You'd much rather be releasing CO2 than releasing amines into the environment, um, right? It's basically, this is like, uh, this is like almost like ammonia, right? Ammonia is a, is a, uh, What's the word? Ammonia is an example of an amine um, compound. Um, And, you know, really bad for fish, bad for plants, bad for all kinds of different things if it gets released. So this is one way of capturing CO2, but it has some downsides. Solid adsorbents, on the other hand, what essentially, uh, these are really good at capturing lots of CO2, but it's through a process known as physical adsorption. And it's really just... um, it's really just the surface of the molecule that gets Mm -hmm. basically like stuck almost. So CO2 on its own, again, looks like this. Those oxygens are negative and the carbon in the center is sort of positive. So what you actually end up happening then in like a solid material is if you have positively charged surfaces, let's say like a porous material that has positively charged surfaces, The CO2, as it goes through, gets stuck because the negative and the positive want to stick together, right? Like magnets, 
It's the same exact idea here. Um, so those are kind of the two main ways of capturing CO2 from the air. Wonderful. Okay, so we have adsorbance, we have absorbance, we've got air revitalization, we've got amines. I think we're doing really, really well in our letter category of A under air revitalization today. <laughs> a lot of A's, a lot of A's going on. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so we, we have these two different sorts of categories. Um, they're you know, from from the way that we utilize things in space, right? I think we utilize actually a lot of these technologies in space for our air revitalization also. And so we do some really cool stuff up there, um, you know, kind of playing with the, the temperatures and the pressures of different things, changing the state of some of these, you know, molecules in order to get them mm -hmm. to a place where they're easier or, you know, or simpler to do some of these processes with. Um, and I also know that um, we're going to dive a little bit deeper in some of the later shows on some of the additional ways of doing some of the air revitalization. So mm -hmm. I would like to take a look maybe at what is the life cycle assessment, right? When we start looking at what does it take to produce some of these things, what happens during its life, and what happens at the end of its life for these two different processes. If we're just focusing on the... Um, the liquid amine option, and we're looking at the solid absorbent options. Can you walk us through maybe what some of the impacts would be on my local community if I were to take one option uh, versus the other in terms of that full cradle to cradle? Yeah, absolutely. And so that's another thing too that we kind of, we sort of glossed over, but it's actually a really important point. Once you capture the CO2, you have to do something with it. And so most, most technologies right now focus on storage of the CO2, but that just creates another landfill. Mm -hmm. And that's not great, right? So we're just going to capture all the CO2, mm -hmm. stick it in a hole in the ground, and I guess hope it never gets released again. Um, a better option is actually using the CO2 to make something, right? So another molecule, cement, a battery, whatever. There's lots of different ideas out there. In terms of the life cycle assessments, if we're just saying, just capturing, not storage or anything else, mm -hmm. like I said, the biggest issue with liquid amine scrubbers, they're, they are really effective and they're cost effective today. We know how to do them industrially. This is something that we're good at doing. The challenge with liquid amine systems is again, that environmental impact, if an amine is released into the environment, it can be really hazardous and harmful. Um, amines can also be, um, again, just toxic to humans, but also to fish, to wildlife, to aquifers, to surrounding areas. So that creates an issue there. The solid adsorbents or other kind of solid materials for capture, part of the issue is that you can't always reuse them as often as you'd like. So let's use the sponge analogy again, right? If you had to choose between a sponge that you could use a hundred times before it stopped working and a sponge that you could only use 10 times, the more cost effective one is of course, the one you can use a hundred times, right? That's the sponge you're going to want to go with right now, given current technologies that appears to be the amines, but there are new materials that are being investigated already, and even some that are out there on the market, things like silicas and zeolites and things like that, that you can use for long enough periods of time to make them economically feasible, besides just being kind of the uh, sensible environmental option. Okay, so then if I was looking at that in terms of life cycle assessment, a means would have would that have a poorer LCA? Yes, just because of the environmental impact is what you're saying. You Even though to... it has a longer life, the impact that it has to my community and the surroundings would give it a lower score. And then the solid absorbance, I may need slightly more of, but it doesn't have such a negative impact on the environment around us. So it might have a, a better life cycle assessment. Yeah, exactly. So the liquid amines are a liquid chemical that you have to treat as a chemical waste, right? Mm -hmm. So that makes them harder to dispose of at the end of their life. The solid adsorbents are easier to dispose of because they're usually just minerals, things like calcium oxide or 
a zeolite or something, right? They're like sand, basically. So those you can dispose of. And since they're solid, even if you did have to kind of store them someplace for a while, um, they're much easier to store than a liquid, which, you know, tends to corrode uh, containers and then flows and, you know what I mean, gets everywhere. Yeah. So. Okay, awesome. Then, Richard, we'd like uh, your help. If we had to do an assessment of this from the viewpoint of the Revislipa folks, help us uh, help us understand from that point of view. Well, so if if we have a problem that we're building it up a lot, that's that's our problem, yeah, because then it starts to heat up the earth. Mm -hmm. Is is that right? Yeah. Then we have to put it into something. What is that something? Yeah, is, is it something that's going to leak out? Let, let's say we pump it into the ground and we're not watching, and it leaks out the side and it's up in the air and the mud is back around, circulating all around. There's all kinds of different things that could happen, yes? Yeah? So what we're talking about is trying to find something that uh, uh, at least chance of that happening, yeah? Mm -hmm. So that, that, that that's about what I, 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 I get so far, yeah? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's perfect. I mean, I think, again, from the perspective of like a community, right? You obviously, if it solves one problem, but it creates another, right? Okay, great. We've got rid of some of the CO2. Now we have this chemical we have to deal with, <laughs> right? You've just, again, kind of kicked the can down the road or maybe even found an, a worse problem, right? There's a famous story in Hawaii, in a, not in Hawaii, but in Australia, a famous story in Australia where they wanted to get rid of like a fly or something. So they in, in, imported toads, right? And then the toads went crazy and overran the island. And so then they were like, well, now what do we import if we want to get rid of these toads? And it just snowballed, right? It's kind of the same thing here. Um, you know, yeah, okay, we can get rid of the CO2. Now we got to get rid of all these other chemicals. Well, then we need a chemical for that. We need a chemical for that, a chemical for that. It's great if you're in the chemical business, not so great if you like live next to one of these <laughs> facilities well i think in hawaii we do have a story a lot like that actually yeah mm. except it's with the mongoose <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i knew hawaii had a story i was like i don't want to say anything it's wrong but yeah it, i mean everywhere has these things right we've tried all they kinds do. of crazy ideas for environmental engineering before it was a thing so yeah you know the the main importance i think really is just learning from those past mistakes and making sure you don't trying to set yourself up to not make them in the future awesome yeah thanks chris okay so um i think in summary there we have different types of state-of-the-art technologies i think we've went through two of a couple um and trying to assess and learn how to assess you know and compare different technologies right we have these two different types of technologies, we are looking at, you know, what do we look at? We look at the environmental impact, right? We look at how are they created or where do they come from? What happens when you dispose of them, right? And as we learned, the escape of some of those into the environment is, is much more damaging than the escape of some of the others. And so these are the things we start looking at, right? When we're talking about a life cycle assessment and when we start looking at a high level, um, what kind of what kind of impact would implementation of these different technologies have in my community? And so as we go through a lot of these series, we're gonna start doing some deep dives into this too, right? We're gonna touch on different letters. We're gonna look at that each time in terms of how do we evaluate this technology, right? How do we know what kinds of implications it would have on my community if you know I were to support um, or oppose? Um, that gives me, I think, a sense of a better sense of understanding as I'm utilizing maybe the tools that I have in my toolbox to look at things from a scientific and engineering standpoint, and maybe a tool that we can start uh, sharing with others, right? Handing those tools out and saying, hey, look at some of the things that we take into consideration uh, when we're having these conversations. And now, of course, a life cycle assessment takes a lot longer than that. I mean, it's very uh, numeric. Um, there's a very long process. It's arduous, of course, but there are ways of evaluating at a high level, doing kind of an inventory, doing kind of a gut check at the top 
and then kind of working your way down into that. So, um, yeah, I, I get I get excited thinking about doing this with a lot of the different technologies. So, um, you know, this one in particularly, we're looking at, OK, we have pollutants in the air. Are there things that have decent LCAs uh, that can help us remove some of those pollutants from the air? And I think as as Chris, um, you know, we work together uh, very closely. And, and as we're both well aware, the answer is, of course, yes, there are uh, wonderful technologies that can do that. As we kind of work through this alphabet, I think we're going to find some really cool solutions um, to a lot of different things um, as we, yeah, work our way from A to Z. So um, with that, do we have any uh, you know, closing remarks, uh, thoughts or comments um, uh, from you first, Richard? Uh, well, you know, uh, just, just listening to you guys, I'm thinking, oh, okay, so there's, there's this... CO, CO2, and if you could take the C out, then and put it somewhere and it won't do anything, I mean, it'll stay there forever, wouldn't mm -hmm. that be a solution? Richard, you're jumping ahead to C, catalysis. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you're stealing, you're stealing the, the letter. We got to get a B first, man. Oh, Come okay. on. <laughs> but yeah, no, you're at, you are absolutely right. Um, for a long time, we thought, We'll just store it. We'll we'll take the CO2. We'll get rid of it. We'll throw it into a dumpster. Um, and of course, we know that doesn't even work for trash, right? It's not a good option. So catalysis, the conversion of carbon dioxide into oxygen, ethanol, methanol, some other chemical that we can use, that is really kind of the gold standard technology for carbon dioxide capture and, and solving climate change. That's going to be the thing that hopefully helps us solve the problem. Yeah. Got it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Wonderful. And any last uh, closing remarks from you, Chris? No, you know, uh, always happy to come on the show. Thanks for having me. Really, for those listening at home, for those watching on YouTube, the most important thing is for you as, as citizens, for you is just people living your lives, regardless of your, you know, background and whatever, you have to know what, what these things mean, right? You have to know how to evaluate them. So, you know, and have the information you need to make decisions about what you want to support. Right. So to me, the most important thing from all this is if we're able to answer your questions, um, that's the best thing we can do. So, if you have questions on this, on the letter A and these technologies that we talked about here today, um, I'm I'm always available to answer them for sure. So send them through the show and, and Brittany knows where to find me. So I'm <laughs> she, she'll be able to get any <laughs> questions. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I think we're at time now, so we're going to have to wrap up. Um I just wanted to say thank you again so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Chris Cogswell. Uh, a pleasure as always. Uh, whenever you pull out a whiteboard, I get excited. So hopefully we'll see lots more of that uh, throughout the alphabet. But um, yeah, this is Brittany Zimmerman on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, we've been talking to Dr. Chris Cogswell uh, from UMA about air revitalization. I want to say thank you again to all of you for being here with us. Um, and thank you uh, to our viewers uh, for watching. If anybody wants to get uh, email advisories to see a complete listing of all of the shows, uh, please feel free to sign up for them on thinktechhawaii.com. But we'll be back in two weeks. So please tune in and tell your friends to tune in then. Uh, and we'll start looking at uh, some more exciting technologies as we move through the alphabet. Until then, uh, I'm your host, Brittany Zimmerman. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.